Trust you have your Bibles this morning, Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9. Moses has passed on. The Lord has, has called Moses home. That happened back in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Moses was 120 years old when he passed. He was a man who had still great sight. A man who had great strength still in his body. According to Deuteronomy chapter 34. But the Lord told him he would see the promised land, but he would never enter Joshua would be his replacement. And Joshua would be immediately blessed in such a way as the replacement for Moses. The Israelites would, would uh, at first, they welcomed him, but it, 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 they welcomed him even more. You just read in Scripture as he proved himself and as being a leader. Joshua would follow the commands of the Lord God day in and day out and be pretty successful at doing it and, and following the commands. And the example was set before him with, with Moses. But one of the commands for Joshua was this, that when you do enter into the promised land, there will be those that are already there. Those that will already be in the place, in the hills and in the valleys throughout Lebanon. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, they'll, all, they'll already be in place in the promised land. But you'll have to clear them out, Joshua. Joshua. You'll have to clear them out. But you won't do it on your time. You will do it on my time. But I'll provide the way as long as you listen and follow my direction. Everything will be fine, Joshua. This won't happen within a year, Joshua. This will take time. Because if it happens too quick, then the wild animals of the land, Joshua, will, will take over too quick and, and then you'll be having to deal with them. So this will happen in my time, not yours. You will clear out the land of those that worship false god, false idols, and you'll destroy them from the young to the old. And, and that's just how it's going to be. It's who I am. I'm a holy God. That was the command. And in chapter 9, And it came to pass when all the kings were on this side of Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and all over the coast of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Prizites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard thereof. So now you have all the kings west of the Jordan. And they heard about what happened. They heard about the power of Israel. But not just the power of Israel, they heard about the power of Israel's what? God. You are exactly right. They heard about Him. They heard about His power to clear out the land before Israel. So they come up with a plan. The Creator God is moving, directing Israel. Word is spreading. Not just word, but fear is setting in. The fear of the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, Jebusites, and so on. Fear is setting in. So these kings of these people come up with an idea to go against Israel. 
will combine our armies to fight as one against Joshua and the Israelites. But when they heard about what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they knew they would not stand a chance at a full out hand to hand combat fight, if you will. So they come up with a plan. Deception in verse 4. They come up with a deceptive plan. They resorted to deception to save themselves. They would send ambassadors to Joshua and they would load their donkeys with worn out saddlebags, weathered saddlebags, old patched wineskins. They did work wildly and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses, wine bottles, old and rent and bound up. They would put on worn out patched sandals and ragged clothes, old shoes clouded upon their feet, old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. So they would make themselves look, okay, these kings, as they sent these ambassadors, if you will, they would make themselves look like they were coming from a faraway land. Not the promised land, but even farther than that. They would make themselves look like they've traveled a great distance to meet up with Joshua. They would wear wore out clothes. Not just wear wore out clothes, but bring wore out food. And when they arrived at the camp of Israel at Gilga in verse 6, they would tell Joshua and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land to make peace. To make a peace treaty with you. We've come from a distant land to make a peace treaty. This is all nothing but deception. All nothing but deception from the enemy. And Joshua should realize this. He's been warned about this. But like the enemy is and always has been so sly in his activities and in his doings. So he will be here. Listen, you'll see as we read down in chapter 9, you'll see your own life. Times of opportunity will come in your own life for a false peace, a false treaty with the enemy of your own soul. A false peace, a false treaty with the enemy of your family will be made, and, it, and if you're not careful, it'll be made by you. Amen. Because you've let your guard down. You thought yourself mightier than what you were. You slipped. You took your eyes off Christ and off His Word. You took your eyes off direction. You see, what do you mean direction? How does this apply to myself? How does this apply to Joshua? Turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 23. Turn to Exodus 23. Way back in Exodus. Not too far back, but Exodus 23 verse 20 remember Joshua and them going into the promised land they're being directed by the Lord God Moses is passed but listen to what Exodus 23 20 says I'm sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place I prepared for you. Basically is what he's saying in verse 20. 
I'm just going to kind of paraphrase this. Pay close attention to him and obey his instructions. I want you to pay close attention to the angel and what he has to say and, and, and obey his instructions. Do not rebel against him for he is my representative. He will not forgive your rebellion. He's not going to forgive your rebellion against me. So you pay close attention to what to what he has to say. If you're careful to obey him, follow all my instructions, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those who oppose you. In other words, King James says, If you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee in, un, in unto the Amorites, to the Hittites, to Brizites, Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Names sound familiar? Do they? We're just reading about them in Joshua 9. For an angel will go before you and bring you, bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And you'll live there. And I will destroy them completely. But you must, not, you must not worship the gods of these nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars. Notice how the Lord says, when you come into the land, and when I give you the word, you must what? Destroy them. Why? Because if you're not careful, you'll be caught in the trap of what? Idolatry. You must serve only the Lord your God. If you do, I will bless you with food and water. I will protect you from illness. There will be no miscarriages or infertility in your land. And I will give you a long, full life. I'm going to send terror ahead of you and create panic among all the people whose land you invade. Is that not exactly what's happening in Joshua chapter 9? The Lord God has sent terror ahead of Joshua and Israel. He sends terror ahead of them. Terror to the enemy. I will make your enemies turn and run. I'm going to send terror ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites. These kings come up with an idea. The enemies come up with the idea. And they come up with an idea of great deception. They're going to send ambassadors down to Joshua. And they're going to say, we're not part of this land. We're not part of this, this land that you're part of now. We come from far away. and We're not your enemy. From we're far away. But I'm not going to drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals would multiply and threaten you. We just talked about that a minute ago. I will drive them out a little at a time until your population has increased enough to take possession of the land. I will fix your boundaries from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, from the eastern wilderness to the Euphrates River. I will hand over to you the people now living in the land and you will drive them out ahead of you. Now listen to this. Don't you make no treaties with them or their gods. Don't you make no treaties with them or their gods. They must not live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me. If you serve their gods, you will be caught in a trap of idolatry. Do not you make a treaty with them. You remember that. As you flip back to Joshua 9, the Lord God in Exodus 23, way before they enter into the promised land, says what? Don't you make a treaty with them. Back in Joshua 9, the ambassadors, as they come to Joshua, would show up with old patched wineskins, weathered saddlebags, worn out sandals, 
and they'll be wearing ragged clothes. And not only that, the bread that they would take with them would be dry and moldy. The bread will be for a sit down. You see, at this culture, at this day and time, when you come together with other people, there's like a sit down and, and treaties were made and, 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 and deals were, were made between two groups and this bread would be made for a sit down, but oh, their bread is dry and moldy. And after the sit down, the treaty was made and you'll find that you cannot go back on that. When they arrived at the camp of Israel at Gilgah, they told Joshua and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land to ask you to make a peace treaty with us. What did we just learn in Exodus 23? What did the Lord God say to the Israelites, to the leaders? Do not you make a treaty when you come into the promised land with the Canaanites. Do not you make a treaty with them. Why? Because they will drag you into what? Sin. Sin. The Israelites reply to the Hivites, How do we know you don't live nearby? For if you do, we can't make a treaty with you. They replied, Oh, we are your servants. But who are you, Joshua demanded? Where did you come from? The answer, your servants have come from a very distant country. We have heard of the might of the Lord your God and all he did in Egypt. We have also heard what he did to the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan, King Sion of Heshbon and King Og of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all our people instructed us, take supplies for a long journey. All this sounds so good. Go meet with the people of Israel and tell them we are your servants. Please make a treaty with us. This bread was hot from the ovens when we left our homes. Oh man, they're laying it on thick, are they not? But now as you can see, it is dry and molded. These wineskins were new when we were filled, but now they are old and split open. Our clothing and sandals are worn out from a very long journey. So the Israelites examined their food. This is it. This is the kicker. But they did not consult the Lord. There it is. What did they do? Joshua and the Israelites, the leading Israelites, they examined the outward appearance, did they not? They examined the sandals. They examined the wine bags. They examined the dry and moldy food. Understandable. But what did they not do? They never consulted who? God. There was their huge mistake. Because what? What would have been said? What would the Lord have said? Do you not remember exactly right? Do you not remember what I told you? We'll say, do you not remember in Exodus chapter 23 because that's how we look at Scripture today. But do you not remember? No, do you not remember what I told you when you were on the other side, when you come into the promised land? Do you not? Do not make any treaties, any peace agreements with the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, and all the rest. Do not make agreements with what? The enemy. And what do they do? Why? This falls in their lap because they did not consult the Lord. He said, well, okay, blah to us. Think about it. Scripture is always, what does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply? Listen, in your life, in your life as a follower of Christ, 
When your decisions are made, some decisions you make, okay, you don't have to consult because you know what it says in Scripture, okay? You don't have to consult the Lord when it says, okay, do not commit adultery on your spouse because you know what Scripture says, all right? But here and in your life, in some instances, there's times in your life that arises when you must consult the Lord. And if you're not careful, what happens? What do we do? We examine the outward appearance, don't we? And everything looks good. And the enemy paints this pretty picture. And everything looks great. Our future spouse might even look good. He or she paints, he or she just checks off every box, don't they? I know several people that are married today that if they would have consulted the Lord before their marriage, they wouldn't be living in misery today. But what happened? They jump ahead. That's just one instance. They jump ahead because they see on the outside appearance everything looks good. She checks, all, she checks all the boxes. He checks all the boxes. But they don't see and they've never consulted what the Lord's will is for them with that person. And it might not be. And it might be you don't need to be with that person in marriage because they might be an unbeliever. Whatever the situation may be. You see with the Joshua and the Israelites they never consulted with the Lord. They never looked to Him. They never looked and they never asked. What's the Lord's will in this? If you're not careful in your life and your human way of thinking and my human way of thinking, we get to the point sometimes in our life to where we just grow in self-confidence, don't we? Huh? You ever been there? Let me tell you who does it the worst. Pastors. Church leaders. The world's worst at it when it comes to the church. You grow in self-confidence. Just grow in self-confidence. I mean, they just ooze in self-confidence. Ooze in it. I read a post this past week, and a gentleman was talking about meeting somebody that was sitting under false teaching for many years and, and how he was given some sermons of this gentleman who had posted this and sermons of MacArthur. And he said when he listened to me and MacArthur preach, then he started crying and seeing his error of his ways. And I thought, you know what, bud, no, calm down. You're, you're, easy, you're oozing with self-confidence. Because it's not you, it's not MacArthur, it's what? It's what Christ does through you. You're just a mere vessel. When He's done with you, He's done with you. And that's what happens. And that's what happened here with Joshua. Oozing with self-confidence. Victory after victory, right? Victory after victory. Everything's going good. We're warned about self-confidence in, in Scripture. If you turn to Psalm chapter 118, Psalm 118 real quick, verse 8 and 9. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in the flesh or in man. Better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princesses. Self confidence. Learn to trust in who the Lord is, your God. Learn to trust in Him. Learn to trust in what it says from Genesis to Revelation because you've been blessed with such a book. Learn to trust in that. We've said it before, you place your trust in so much in your daily life. 
But may we learn to place our trust over and above in what Christ has to teach us in Scripture. And not in man. Not in self. Again, Joshua, the Israelites, could have avoided a lot of heartache if they would have listened to what they were commanded in Exodus. When you come into the land, I will put such fear in those people and you will slowly take them over. Not in your own power, but it will be in my power. But you must destroy them. Why? Because if you do not, they will drag you into what? idolatry they will drag you into a false worship and the worship will not be of me you hear people say sometimes man the God of the Old Testament is man, the, the, the killing oh, but you don't grasp the holiness of who he is His holiness and His demand for His chosen people. You placed your confidence in me and me alone. As the psalmist says in 118, it's far better to place trust in me, the Word, the author of Scripture, than to place trust in man. It's far better to place trust in the Lord. And if man's not good enough in a sense, then, then to place trust in kings or princesses. Boy, we are living in a day and time, are we not, where people's trust is placed over in abundance in man, in the government, Amen. Amen. in the society in which we live, in the government in which we have. And you see what that gets you. You see, Proverbs chapter 19 says this, man will make plans, okay? But God's will prevails. How does it apply to Joshua? Listen, Joshua had a plan. And it wasn't the right plan. God's will will ultimately prevail. But what? Joshua and the Israelites are going to suffer because what? Because of their failure to focus solely on the will of God. As they found themselves focusing on their own plan. They found themselves focusing on what they thought was right. They focused on the outward appearance and they didn't consult the God of Scripture. Like I said before, be careful in your life that you don't find yourself focusing on circumstances. And not the God of Scripture. David Hudson was just talking about circumstances in his own life this past week. And David can attest, I'm sure. Melissa was just talking about circumstances this week in her own life. At work. We all can relate. We all this week at one point or another, we're focused more on our circumstances than we were the God of Scripture. Amen. Weren't we? If we're honest. Yes, yes, true. It's very true. We're focused more on our circumstances. We're focused more on what was 
On what, on what was tangible. On what we can reach out and touch. On what we can reach out and feel. On what we can reach out and carry. On what we can hear. That's what we were focused on. Yes. That's what we were focused on. Joshua was focused on what? He sees the so-called evidence. He sees the wore out food. He sees the wore out clothes. The wore out wine skins. And he takes that for a guaranteed answer. Amen. Instead of consulting with the Lord. He didn't take it to the Lord. And listen, your decision, whether right or wrong, not only affects you, but oh, 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 how it affects. Like a rock hitting a pond, it ripples into other people's lives, Amen. whether right or wrong. Amen. Does it not? Of course it does. Amen. What happened to Joshua? His decision, what? Affected who? Israelites. You'll see that. It affected a whole nation. Affected a whole nation. Affected a whole nation of people. See, it's just not your decision. Your, your decision about not consulting the Lord in times in your life is not just going to affect you if you're married, it's going to affect your spouse. It's not just going to affect you if you've got kids, but it's going to affect your children. It's going to affect your church. It's going to affect your friends. It's the reality of it. You don't like to look at it that way. Nobody does. But it's the truth. Amen. In Joshua 9 verse 15, then Joshua made a peace treaty with them and guaranteed their what? Safety. And the leaders of the community ratified their agreement with a binding oath. There's no turning back. Not at this point. They made a peace treaty. What were they told, will say, us, Exodus 23, as we just read at the beginning, the command from the Lord God was what? When you come into the land, do not make a peace treaty with these people. Again, for they will lead you into what? And the Lord God named the sin. You see, from idolatry, tentacles and branches off numerous sin. Numerous. You look at the idol, the idol worship of the Old Testament, and you look and see what it was filled with. It was filled with baby sacrifice, children's sacrifice. It was filled with sexual perversion at a level you can't even... Fathom, if you, you can look into it for yourself, I'm not going to talk about it. All that branched off what? One sin. Idolatry. Amen. The Lord names one sin. He knows what's going to come off this one sin and it's going to be all this is going to tentacle off idolatry. And that's exactly what happened. The worship of one idol leads to worship of another idol. And it leads to the worship of another, another idol. And it just keeps branching off, branching off. And it just gets worse and worse. Because what happens with man and his humanness is what? Just like, just like somebody, just like people in an adulterous affair. When you talk to them or you, or you hear them being interviewed, they, they'll talk, at first they'll say, just being what one person wasn't enough. Then I wanted another person. It just gets worse and worse and worse. It just, it just grows and grows and grows and it, and it tentacles out. And that's what the Lord is saying to Israel. He said, if you do not, if you make a peace treaty with these people, they will drag you into idolatry and that sin will tentacle, tentacle out into my chosen nation. And it's the same thing for your life and it's the same thing for mine. Amen. It's the same thing. You make a habit of not consulting the Lord, not consulting Scripture in your life. That's the danger of weak preaching. That's the danger of, of preaching without Scripture. That's the danger of opening up Scripture and reading it for about five or ten minutes and then walking away from it and never going back to it again with a congregation, three, four hundred people sitting in front of you. Oh, everything looks good. Everything looks fantastic. You're filled with programs and all this other stuff. But there's a huge danger to that, isn't there? 
The danger is what? Our world today. Yeah. The danger is not consulting with Scripture. Which will inevitably lead you or lead somebody to a peace treaty with the enemy. Making a deal with the devil. Many families today have made a deal with the devil. Many spouses have made a deal with the devil. The leaders of the community ratified their agreement with abiding oath. You see, at this day and time, when that happened, that was it. That was it. You, that was it. Three days after making the treaty, they learned that these people actually lived nearby. Can you imagine the feeling? Can you imagine the feeling of being deceived? You ever been deceived by somebody? Deceived by what they said? When you found out that you were deceived? You couldn't believe it. Deception. Three days after making the treaty, they learned that these people have actually lived, lived nearby. And the Israelites set out at once to investigate and reach their towns in three days. They weren't for three days journeys away. They told the Israelites that they were miles and miles and miles and miles away. It wasn't just for three days journey. That's it. The names of the town were Gibeon, Kapora, Beroth. But the Israelites did not attack the towns for the Israelites' leaders had made a vow to them in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. Now look and see what happens. You say, what happened? What did it say in verse 18? The, the, the elite leaders had made a vow with them in the name of who? <laughs> in the name of the Lord. The God of Israel. Oh my gracious, you're exactly right. Now they make, the vow is made in the name of who? The Creator God. You see how things spiral out of control. Do you see that? If you just read that and move on, you will not pick that up. You won't pick it up. You'll just move on through verse 18. Now they drag the name of God into their filthy peace tree. Is that not a heinous sin or what? Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds you of the New Testament when, when Christ was doing miracles and they said he's performing miracles in the name of Beelzebub. Remember that? Amen. Remember that statement. <clears throat> they actually said Christ is performing, name, performing miracles in the name of the devil. That's man in his depravity, isn't it? Amen. You see, but as you read this and move on down, it's too late. The people of Israel will grumble against their leaders because of the treaty. There's nothing you can do about now. Amen. Now it's time to suffer the consequences. And in your life and in my life, listen. That's why it is so vitally important to stay close to Scripture, to stay close to the God of the Bible, to stay close to Him in prayer, to so saturate yourself with Him. Because around the corner, around every corner, not every corner, but around a lot of corners in your life, if you will, your enemy is waiting. And he's not only waiting to drag you down, but he's waiting to drag your friends down, your church down, your family down. He's dragged, we're ready and willing to drag you down. Amen. And here you see that plainly in Joshua chapter 9 with devastating effect. 
And not only that, but the name of the Lord is dragged too. Amen. Have you ever heard somebody say something about a church? You all, you all have. I know you have. because We all have. Boy, I know about that church down the street. His pastor involved in with another woman or whatever the sin may be. Who are they hitting? Are they hitting the pastor? No. <clears throat> Who's the enemy going after? The God of the church. Amen. This is who the shot was. But it just come through to one that committed the sin. Amen. As we close, you be very careful in your life. You make a habit, you make a habit of consulting the Lord. Amen. Make a habit of consulting the Lord in Scripture. In your decisions. See what decisions? You know what? You know, you know the decisions you need to make a habit of consulting the Lord. You don't need to make a habit of consulting the Lord or getting a drink of water. But you know the decisions that you need to consult the Lord in. Make a habit of consulting Him. Not looking at the outward appearance, but looking at what He has to say. Not listen to some voice in your head or saying, well, I think he tossed, said this to me last night as I was sleeping. Or, you know, my belly grumbled. No, you just had indigestion, okay? That had nothing to do with the Lord talking to you. Of what he says in Scripture through deep prayer. That's the habit to make. Amen. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we, we thank you and we love you. You truly are the God of the Bible. And you do warn us, as you warned Israel, as you warned Moses, as you warned Joshua. When you go into the land, these people, I will make them fear you. I will go ahead of you. But do not make a treaty with them. For they will drag you down into the worship of somebody other than me. We see their failure, we see their sin, but we see how easily each and every one of us in here this morning is a Joshua, each capable and already have made decisions, decisions that should have been consulted with you first. Hey, maybe even decisions that even if consulted with you, would have we, we made the right decision. You would have, that would have been the answer. But oh, the time does come when the decision is made. It is not your will. And the consequences may be one day, one month, or maybe for a physical lifetime. I don't know. But we love you. May we learn to consult in you in the things that need to be consulted in. May we learn to grow close in Scripture to you in prayer, to you in fellowship. We love you and we thank you. Bring us back here this evening to once again worship you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.